So um, this talk is joint work uh, with Peter Acht and Rienus Pasmeijer, my former colleagues from Radboud University in the Netherlands. This is actually um, a talk based on one of the chapters in my PhD thesis. Um, and it's about static and dynamic visualizations of uh, monadic programs. And visualizations implies pictures, so yes, I'll have pictures. Uh, starting with the by far the coolest pictures in this uh, deck of slides. So this is an OPV or uh, ocean going patrol vessel. These are very cool looking ships, like in real life they're even cooler than on this picture uh, of the Royal Netherlands Navy. And the Navy has been so kind as to pay for my PhD, so I'm ever so grateful for them. Now the, the Netherlands Navy is actually quite special when it comes to navies because most navies uh, buy a ship turnkey as it's called so they have the platform systems like engines etc good to go and they have the weapon systems good to go they just have to turn the key and uh, take it out uh, out to sea uh, now the the netherlands navy is a bit special so they do buy the platform systems uh, off the shelf pretty much but we we write our own software for the for the, the the weapon systems for the sensors and we integrate them with the platform system so our ships are very intelligent um, so all the systems can kind of talk to each other and that of, of course eventually allows you to do massive amounts of automation on board of your ships. Um, the problem is that this automation isn't there yet so it needs to be developed. So you have all these very well trained men and women on these ships that are very good at what they do but their training is based on well, pretty much the same notions as you know the military has always used in the past uh, decades or even hundreds of years a hierarchical chain of commands people running around and like um, communicating via uh, notes uh, and and uh, via telephones so of course we want automation but it's a bit of a challenge because these people are very good at um, doing military things and you know we were we were very good at doing computer things but somehow these two worlds need to be able to talk to each other in order to create software that is useful um, for them on board of their ships, particularly if they're being um, fired at, um, but also, uh, you know, software that is robust and it does what it's supposed to do, and we need to kind of know what they want. So, in, in software development in general, you end up talking to a lot of uh, domain experts, like the people on board of the ship, the military people, the, the managers that manage the projects, um, so the, the people that actually end up using the software. And usually this uh, entire process is facilitated by tedious word documents and maybe some other form of specification. Then if you want to kind of uh, confirm whether the software is kind of the right software, whether it does what it's supposed to be doing, you maybe grab one of these documents and start uh, ticking things off or you just start using the software and uh, you kind of try to find out in an experimental manner whether the software is actually the right thing. but this is, is quite error prone, it's very time consuming and even if you accept that it's just very important that you have good communication um, it's only with good communication and good tools to support this communication can you actually uh, you know, speed up this entire process of, of talking uh, you know, uh, enlisting requirements and, and verifying uh, your software implementation etc. So um, to kind of reduce this communication gap, uh, in Nijmegen we've been working on a thing called task-oriented programming. It's um, so so your your basic element, your basic building block of your application, is no longer a function. For example, it is a task, which is this high-level thing, and it kind of, in a more natural way, corresponds to the notion of task that we have uh, as humans. Um, so. Um, tasks can be assigned to someone, they can be worked on, they uh, can uh, evolve over time, uh, etc. Now based on this task description that a programmer now makes, um, we use techniques like type-driven generic programming to generate pretty much every other part of the program. So this kind of absolves you of uh, all the tedious programming that you usually have to do if you want to, uh, we're, we're making a web-based application by the way, so usually you would be managing client-server communication, rendering of HTML, blah, 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 all the boring stuff that's somehow still necessary. But 
because that's tedious and error prone, we just generated it all, and it's very convenient. Now, we um, implemented this a long time ago, even before I started my PhD, even before I started my master's. Uh, this is implemented as a uh, shallowly embedded domain-specific language in clean. And for those of you who don't know clean, it is a purely functional programming language with lazy semantics that's been developed around the same time as Haskell, so it's been around since the 80s. Uh, the only difference, well, there are several differences in several sub differences in semantics and and uh, notation, um, but a, a more a practical difference is that people actually use Haskell and hardly anyone uses Clean, except uh, we in Nijmegen. Um, but still, for the purposes of my research, but also for the purposes of this um, this presentation, uh, we'll be using Clean, and I'm going to assume that if you're all familiar with Haskell, you'll be able to read Clean without any problems, because the syntax is nearly identical. So um, let's give a first code example of an iTask program. Now, this is a very silly program. Um, it uh, asks the user to enter a number. It uh, shows the number back to the user. And depending on whether it's smaller than 42, it gives either the one message or the other message. Now, um, a task starts with a function definition. A task is this, this monad-like type with a return type string. So this is uh, a task. You see the familiar bind combinators. This thing uh, is the same as, as in Haskell if you leave out the pipe. It's just different syntax, slightly different. Numbers are the same in the uh, conditional. Here you see that there's no then and else as in Haskell, but for the rest it's just an if. And this is actually all that's needed to make an iTask program. Now, if I were to add one more line, which is kind of the, the main function that basically bootstrapped this all, this is really just one more line. This generates an entire multi-user web application, including a server. And that's pretty cool. Um, now, this task abstraction is already pretty good at uh, closing the communication gap because we're now talking about tasks and of course if you define a lot of tasks as a programmer your uh, tasks will have more descriptive names most likely also more descriptive types that more closely correspond to the the application domain for which you're developing a, uh, an application so it really becomes a more natural fit a more natural kind of language that you can talk about uh, but it's still code right and we see maybe you know the the structure of the program kind of the shape we see oh that's just a bind so that just means uh, you know sequential composition a and user sees this greater than greater than equal sign and there's this backslash and there's this dash and this other greater than and it's all very complicated and scary so that's a problem now um what I introduced in my PhD thesis was this, I call it tonic, which stands for task-oriented notation inferred from code. I, I had the word tonic first, and then I <laughs> kind of thought about what that should <laughs> stand for. I think I got away with it. Um, so the, the idea is that given this, this piece of code, um, we generate a graphical representation of this code you can do a, um, a flow diagram. So if you know BPMN, for example, the, the business process model and notation or whatever, it, it should look familiar. Um, so we generate this at compile time. So um, you can take a look at the structure of just your code and kind of represent that um, as a drawing. And that's what we call a static blueprint. Um, now, actually, it turns out we did this. Uh, initially, I did this for I tasks. Uh, it turns out you can generalize this to monads, all monads. Um, then, of course, static blueprints are rather boring. What you also want is, while the program is 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 being used, you kind of want to see how the program evolves over time, right? So you want to see maybe the task the user is working on. Maybe you even want to like inspect their values, so you can have a tracer or a debugger, or um, so th this would be a, a technical application. Uh, of course, you can also just sit down with an end user and say, well, 
hey, um, I have this graphical representation of my program. Just have a look at it. Maybe it makes sense to you. And here, when we use this program, this is how the workflow goes. And maybe you can get a more intuitive feeling of whether this makes sense to you, whether this is really how you guys um, solve your problems or work on your tasks if you're doing things in real life. Uh, so we want to make this thing understandable to programmers. Now, what does it look like, finally? So here's a program that we had before. Now this, and I hope you can see it in the back. Good. This is a blueprint. Now this is actually generated from this. So what, what I do is I actually hack the clean compiler. And I take a look at the uh, core representation of this program. And it turns out I can generate all of this. I output a basically a serialized abstract syntax tree. And I, I've implemented a new fully declarative SVG rendering library. So I can just easily make these kind of pictures. So what you see here, we have an enter information, uh, a box with the task name on top of it. In this case, it's enter information. This corresponds to this line here. This is the enter information task. Um, out of it comes a thing called, uh, that we have called num here. So that's just a variable here that we bind in this lambda. We, we overlay this on the, on the arrow here. So you see this kind of flow out of this box and it kind of enters this new box, this view information task where it is used. So you can have this, um, so you can present this on the screen, for example. Then here we have a decision node. So if num is uh, smaller than 42, which is this conditional here, then either you go into this branch and you can, uh, this is a, this is a let this signpost thingy, and you end up in in this other few information task. Or if it's not, you kind of recurse. So this this node is just a recursion node um, into the task again, so that you can do this entire program again until you enter like something uh, forty two or or grazer. Now, of course, this is already pretty cool. I would argue that this is infinitely more. Uh, infinitely less scary for a, a, a layman than, than this. I hope you agree with me. Um, of course, we want to do a bit more. Uh, we want to, like, wh when people are at this stage, we want to kind of highlight this box here. When you know, they continue to the next task, we want to kind of tick this, this task off to kind of show, okay, we're done with this one, and now this one is active. And uh, maybe we want to do some other things like uh, as, as soon as we kind of know the value of num after this step, maybe we even want to um, highlight which of these branches uh, we will enter in the future. Now, this is actually a lot more challenging. So the static blueprints were relatively easy to, to do. Uh, adding this dynamic feature in such a way that you don't kind of pin the compiler to a specific framework, but keep this general, that would turn out to be a bit trickier. Um, now, the reason why I implemented this in the clean compiler, ideally you don't want to touch your compiler, right? Ideally you want to do everything in user space. But like I said, iTasks is a shallowly embedded domain specific language, which means you can use all the language features that clean has to offer, which are pretty much the same ones you have in Haskell, like conditionals, the case, uh, uh, the let, lambdas. Now at runtime, these are no longer tangible. You can't just take them and inspect them and do things with them. So writing an interpreter over them, just is, you can't. But at the same time, these things are very important to kind of understand the flow of the program. So if you would um, leave out, for example, the conditional here, because you, you can't access it at runtime, the entire kind of meaning of this entire blueprint changes. It's a lot less in informative. So the, the end user looking at this picture has, uh, doesn't really have a clue what's going on in this program. Like vital information is missing. Um, so you need it, but this is only available at compile time, unfortunately. So what we did, um, this is like a schematic overview of what a compiler looks like roughly on the inside. So you start with your source code. Typically you, you parse it, of course, then you desugar it, kind of get rid of the excess syntax. So you get to a, a core-like language. Then type information turns out to be very useful for this entire endeavor. And from this, we, we kind of 
branch off. So this is the conventional pipeline that you expect. So uh, some core to core transformations, uh, code generation, and eventually you'll have your executable. But from here, we split off to this entire thing uh, about blueprints. So we take this core language and generate these blueprints. So we need type information for that. So we split off after type checking. But of course, this is a heavily desugared core language. So all the lambdas have been lifted. So there are no more lambdas in your core language. Macros, clean as macros, so they are expanded. Um, list comprehensions, they are mutilated. You can't, you can hardly reconstruct them. Conditional and cases, well, they too are mutilated as it turns out, like a lot of them are transformed into cases. And in order to get like a nice picture, you have to like reverse a lot of these uh, transformations. You add a bit of sugar. It can be quite, quite tedious. Um, so this is one of the challenges that we encountered while, while implementing this. So, um, when you talk about the dynamic blueprint, so again, what, what do we want to see? So we want to see, we want to look into the past. Fortunately, that's relatively easy. So which tasks uh, have finished? Uh, what was their result? You may be interested in that as well. Um, which tasks can never be reached again? Maybe useful as well. Uh, we want to take a look at the present. So which tasks are currently active? What is their current value? And when the value changes, we kind of want to see that change live. And um, we also want to look into the future. So which tasks might become active in the future? Which tasks are no longer reachable at all? Um, so the challenge here is to relate this this dynamic runtime to these static blueprints and these are two two different worlds right so the static world is the compiler world it's the thing that you do once the dynamic world is this thing like it's ever changing you never know really what the user is going to do your program can evolve in many different ways so you need to connect these two worlds and how uh i did this we'll see later on in the slides but first i'm going to show you some some pictures more pictures um iTask has the notion of parallel tasks or tasks like uh, flows that can execute in parallel. Turns out to be rather tricky as well. And of course, clean is a functional language. So we have higher order functions, but we also have higher order tasks. So tasks can be an argument to other tasks. So higher order task is a thing that we need to support as well. So you can have a variable that actually is a task and that evolves over time as well because it depends on to which task you apply your other task what that node is supposed to be at runtime because you don't know statically of course so um to view these dynamic blueprints i created this this viewer application you can kind of see this as your debugger uh if you will like the your webkit inspector maybe so this tiny window here is an example of the iTask application that you saw earlier being executed. So just based on this task specification, like mind you, I've non done nothing else except this, this one line or main function that you didn't see. And it generates this thing, like entirely with, uh, with uh, validation. So you can only really enter integers here and otherwise like your, your uh, client even starts to complain like nice error messages and whatever. So, while you execute this program, you see here that this blueprint is now instantiated. So tasks and iTask have a unique number, which you can see here. The user, well, that's me, who's working on the task right now. You can see that information here as well. Um, the currently active task is the enter information with the description enter a number. And lo and behold, that's actually the case. Um, you can see here, like you see in the future, that we still have the possibility of reaching either of these branches of this conditional, right? Because we haven't entered a number yet. So we can still end up either here or there. And if we inspect the value of this task, well, there's currently no value because the user left the input field empty. Now, if I enter a number, this already starts changing. It, uh, it does so in a reactive way. If you would execute this, I was not brave enough to actually give a live demo. Um, <laughs> so you can see this value changing here in the inspector window. Um, funnily enough, you can now also see this color changing because if we enter one, two, three, then 
the number is no longer smaller than 42. And that means that we will end up in this branch here. And that means that if this stays the way it is, this branch can no longer be reached. So if we would change that, um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a screenshot. If you would then, for example, uh, take the three out so they become 12, you will immediately see these color changes as well. It's kind of fun. So suppose we're happy with um, the value one, two, three. Ooh, no, no. Um, then we enter the next task. So uh, we get into this view information task with this message. You have entered blah, which is shown here as well. We see that the color changes here. It's kind of blue. Uh, I, I chose blue because it kind of shows a, a task frozen in time. Um, so this one is done. And you see the, the, the workflow has kind of moved on. Um, now if we take one more step. So this thing predicts that we'll end up in this branch. I think we will. Yes, we will. Um, so now you see we recurse into the same task again. We see that this branch is now uh, really no longer reachable. So this is grayed out. And we see that a new instance of this task is created. And this is exactly what's going on, right? So we see a, a new entry here with some extra information, media information. This entire thing starts again. Um, that thing is now also blue. Uh, so it's, it's done. And to continue, we're here again. Now we enter a number that is indeed smaller than 42. Confirm. Now you see the color changing here. This becomes green, that becomes red. Gergo? Uh, yeah. um, yes, there is. But um, that's in the compiler, right? Um, this is also monadic program, so telco elimination is probably not applicable here. Right? Is it? But. Uh, it doesn't really matter because this is just meta meta information. Uh, the, whether there is still call elimination in uh, in clean, but um, it doesn't really matter if uh, the, it's you you want to see this this past result anyway because it's kind of the way your program evolved, right? So this is uh, does not represent in that sense how the runtime uh, the, the clean runtime deals with your program and it's kind of the, the semantic representation of, of the execution of your program. Sorry, come again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah. So right now, uh, it may be a bit hard to see. So here you see a, a small square on the side of a task. You click these and that means, okay, inspect the value of this task. Now a task has a task value, which changes over time if you, um, you know, work on the task. So if someone changes the value of the text field, that task value is updated as well. And what we do, well, internally in ITask, this is all maintained in some administration, right? So there's this concept of, this is a bit off topic for the talk, but there's this concept of a so-called shared data store. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of a, a reactive, um, yeah, sort of a sort of reactive IO ref kind of thing. <laughs> Yes. No, it's, uh, well, it's a new instance of the same task. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so this was the old instance. So this is task number 1-9. And this is the new instance with task number 1-13. And these numbers don't really mean anything per se, but it does show that it is indeed a, a different instance of the same task. Yeah. Well, I mean, we uh, I use t type information to distinguish tasks for, from other functions, but um, I do look like okay. Do I see a bind? 
Uh, bind Combinator, or do I not see Bind Combinator? And if I see Bind Combinator, okay, what's the type of this thing? Yeah, oh, pr uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, anytime a task is evaluated, like it's instantiated in the runtime, the idask runtime, and it gets like a new task number. And um, this can be rather complex, especially if you start um, delegating tasks and if you start doing tasks in parallel. Um, but yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, so now we have entered uh, twenty-one, which gets us into this. A true branch. So now we're in this view information that says, okay, approved, 21 looks good, and this branch is now grayed out, so we can no longer reach this. Um, now, how do we do this? How do we identify things that should go into a blueprint and things that do, should not go into a blueprint? So, in the very first iteration of the system that I wrote, I actually basically said, okay, I would just want to have this working. So I'm going to basically <laughs> make a very hard connection between the clean compiler and iTasks. So the clean compiler, clean is a general purpose programming language with which you can do everything. And iTasks is this very specific framework. And ideally you don't want the clean compiler to know about iTasks. But for the very first iteration, I did make this hard connection, which is of course wrong. <laughs> Uh, but I did so anyway. So then in the second iteration, uh, which this publication was about, I, I uh, managed to disconnect uh, like uh, the, the compiler from my tasks um, by introducing these uh, two type classes. So the first class is called Top Level Blueprint, and it is for some type M, um, which also happens to have an instance, needs to have an instance of this class blueprint part. Now basically it says for, for this type M for which you instantiate this type class, you should generate a blueprint. So anytime you come across a function that you know, results in something of this type M, you should start applying your, your blueprint logic in the compiler. So now it is no longer a compiler looking for something of type task, it's just looking for something for which there is an instance of this type class. Now the second type class, the blueprint part of M, um, says, okay, whenever you uh, encounter a function application of a function which has a result type, some monad M here for which we have an instance of this type class, you should start drawing these boxes and these arrows and things. So for everything that is a top level blueprint, like for which we want to draw a blueprint in the first place, we definitely need a blueprint part, uh, but not necessarily the other way around. So for example, we may want to have a um, draw boxes and arrows basically for say a maybe, maybe monad, but we probably don't want to have like an entire blueprint for a maybe monad. And this is something you can play with. This is user level code, user, le user land code, so you can kind of play with your own instantiation of the type, these type classes depending on what you want your blueprints to look like. Um, and this is basically a slightly more formal uh, expression of what I just said. I'll, I'll skip this. So to the, that is with, with that information alone, you can already start generating the static blueprints for any kind of monadic uh, thing that you might want. Now, of course, we also want this dynamic behavior. So for that, I added some uh, functions to these type classes, and they basically take some meta information um, at runtime. So what I do is I take the original program, and I, I apply some program uh, transformations to insert these functions. And of course, there's some fine tuning there as well. Uh, in the simplest case, this is just an identity function. You ignore all these arguments and you just have an identity function. And then you don't have any uh, uh, runtime information, but at the very least you have an instance of this class, so you can at least get these static blueprints. Uh, then this function thing here that allows you to do this kind of prediction of, of where you'll end up in the future. Um, I won't go over that in detail. Read the paper. Um, same thing for these top-level blueprints, same concept. Again, in the simplest case, this thing is, the rep body thing is just a, an identity function, and this rep arg, in the simplest case, is just a, a pure unit. 
Um, now, so we have implemented these uh, type classes, instantiated them for the task type. So in this example, we generate uh, the boxes and arrows for the tasks and also the top level blueprint. And in this particular case, we only want to uh, generate the, the, the boxes and arrows basically for the maybe type in this, this example. So that way you get nice blueprints for maybe, but you don't get like, or boxes and arrows for maybe, but none entire blueprints. And of course, you can do this for other things as well. So you can think maybe I want blueprints for the IO monad. And in Haskell, you're uh, maybe a tiny bit screwed because IO is very special. In Clean, we have uniqueness typing. And the IO monad is just a regular type. And we have uniqueness to kind of thread this world pointer through the IO monad. So we can just uh, inspect it and have this. Uh, just treat it as a normal state monad. Uh, for example, if you have parser combinators, you can do the same. So you can um, imagine that you have just very nice graphical representations of your parsers. I'm not sure how useful that is, but it's pretty cool. Um, so just to experiment a bit. So, okay, what um, I, I now have these dynamic blueprints for tasks. And that's rather easy because the task monad is a very rich monad and the entire iTask runtime is very sophisticated and advanced. So uh, if you want to do anything with it, it's really rather easy. But something maybe a bit more basic like the IO monad, um, that turns out to work as well. So this is a very contrived example um, with stupidly simple functions here. But um, it, it does the trick. So we generate this static blueprint for this program. Uh, at the time when I made this presentation, I didn't really have a uh, fancy viewer application like the one we saw earlier. So my dynamic output was uh, a bit more uh, basic. <laughs> so this is what you would see on a command line when this program would run. But it does kind of give you a textual... Uh, uh, you know, output or you know, textual, textual visualization of the um, evaluation of your, your program. So this you can see as uh, kind of the, the, the dynamic blueprint of the IO monad. Uh, I worked on this some more and I actually managed to get a basic viewer, a general purpose viewer to work where you could actually see these boxes turn into different colors as well. Uh, but I didn't have any screenshots of it unfortunately. And my my local installation of this all was bit rotted, of course, so I couldn't, couldn't make a screenshot of that. Now, to wrap this up, we can do static blueprints for all monads, as long as, of course, you have the instances of these type classes. We could do uh, dynamic blueprints, as it turns out, for state monads. So there's a bit of a restriction there, because in a lazy functional language, of course, the order of evaluation is not defined. Uh, but the, the state that is threaded through the state monad kind of uh, enforces this order of evaluation, right? Um, so we can do things like track the progress of a task flow. So that's the thing with the colors. Um, we can dynamically show like which branches of your program you can still reach or can't reach anymore. We can inspect task values. Now we've only seen uh, this value one, two, three, and forty-two and twenty-one, etc. But iTask is is so expressive. Like we can have a Google Maps type as well. And if you do a view information on a Google Maps type, um, you can actually render a Google Maps. So the cool thing is if you inspect something of uh, type task Google Maps, the inspector will actually just show you a Google Map using the same application logic. So it's, it's really pretty cool, an interactive Google Map even. Um, so we can uh, substitute variables at runtime as well. Um, we, for example, this comes in handy with higher order tasks. And we can uh, we have parallel tasks that can grow dynamically as well. So this is like expanded life. So you can imagine, for example, say you enter a number in some, some input box. That number determines how many uh, tasks are spawned in parallel. Uh, this, this all works in this dynamic sonic viewer. So it's, it's really quite sophisticated and cool. And um, future work, of course. Now, I... I had the ambition of working on this viewer for dynamic blueprints. I never really got the time, unfortunately, to kind of finish my work as well. Um, there is no reason why this wouldn't work in, say, GHC. Supporting so this to a 
uh, somewhat more widely used language would probably be fun and useful as well. Now, there are definitely some relationships between the sonic idea and uh, traces and debuggers. So that's something we need to uh, look into as well. And uh, I started this presentation with, yeah, cool, we have military ships and, and all this, and, you know, end users and communication. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to do a formal study to see whether our entire idea and our entire motivation is, is actually uh, kind of works. So whether it actually uh, does aid in, in communication, and, uh, et cetera. So we did a, a study uh, with second year bachelor students that were um, during the second functional programming course in which they would learn about monads and typically like students would, would fear this course, right? <laughs> so, oh no, monads, it's gonna be so complicated. Um, so we gave them these, these blueprints and we, we recorded them while they were working on their assignments. We interviewed them and uh, it was very tedious research. But um, <laughs> we looked at the scores, exam scores as well. They, they did score better after using this, but only uh, by uh, 1%. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably not statistically uh, significant, unfortunately. So but uh, we, we may want to kind of, there was a, a classroom setting, which has the advantage, okay, they have exams, they have kind of scores, but it's hard. Um, now, we actually wanted to try and kind of test this with uh, TNO, which is a Dutch research uh, lab that um, does most military projects or in, is, is involved with most military projects in the Netherlands. But we never really got the chance because of time, pretty much. So that's all to do. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>